Math 31, let's take a look at rational equations. And I mentioned this at the top of the section, but whenever you hear rational, the word ratio is hiding out in there. So when we hear rational equations, we're talking about equations where there are fractions. All right, so we're gonna look at rational equations in the next couple of examples. So a rational equation contains at least one rational expression where the variable appears in at least one of the denominators. So here are a couple of examples, right? We have our variable and a denominator here, so one over x minus three is equal to seven. This is a rational equation. Rational expression, right, and an equal sign. Here is a more complicated rational expression. And again, our variable is in the denominator. And it's not to say that our variable couldn't be in a numerator. We have a variable in both the numerator and denominator over here, but your variable needs to at least be in the denominator. So here we have four over x squared plus x minus two, x minus one over x plus two. So both sides of this equation are rational expressions, where over here, just this side of the equation was a rational expression. And I do wanna give you just a quick counter example. If you saw something like x plus four over seven equaling three, that is not considered a rational equation. And you might say, well, why not? I see the fraction and I see the equal sign. Yeah, no, that's, those are great points, but you need your variable to be in the denominator for it to actually qualify as a rational equation. This is actually a linear equation because x is just raised to the first power, right? This is 1 7th x plus 4 7th equaling 3. So this is actually a linear equation, not a rational equation. And I do want to mention before we get moving on, when you introduce fractions, oh, let me just put here not a rational equation, just so we have that counterexample. Um, but when you introduce fractions, you introduce a domain issue in math. And there are three domain issues that we're gonna talk about in Math 31. So let me just write them out now, because I will wind up writing them many times throughout this, this course. So the first one that you have to look at is, do you have a fraction where your denominator is zero. If you do, that's gonna be a problem. So we'll address that in, in these examples because we do have fractions. The other one that you might run into that I, I have a feeling you've seen before is when you take the square root of a negative number and you're allowed to take odd roots of negative numbers but not even roots of negative numbers. So if you have a even index and a negative radicand, that's a problem. Okay. And when I say even index, index is this number that's out in front here. So if you have like a square root, a fourth root, a sixth root, when I say radicand, that's the stuff that comes under the square root symbols. So when you have that combo, that's a problem. That's a domain issue that we're gonna have to talk about. And when we get to radicals, we'll discuss it. Right, I'm gonna come around over here because I'm kind of run, actually I'll just, I'll scooch it in right below here. The third type of domain issue that we will run into but much later on during this course is when you take the logarithm and your argument is zero or a negative, all right? So I'll put here a logarithm with zero or negative argument. And you may or may not have seen logarithms before, but if you have, usually you have logs and then something in the parentheses. This something in the parentheses is what we call our argument. So if whatever is in here is zero or negative, that's going to be a problem. All right, and we'll talk about this domain issue again later on in the semester. We'll get to radicals not too far from now, but we're, we're here with, with the fractions. So for example, in this rational equation, if x were to equal three, that would be a problem because three minus three would give me zero. So I would have a domain issue here. I would have all real numbers except for x equaling three. For this fraction, if I have x plus two on the denominator, x couldn't equal negative two because negative two plus two would equal zero, so that's a problem. This fraction is a little bit more intricate. I'd have to factor it and use the zero product property to figure out when the denominator would be zero. And, and we're gonna look at something similar to this 
in example four. So I, I will, or excuse me, in example three, part D. So we'll unpack this in a little bit. So let's take a look at what we do have, keeping in mind that we should talk about domain first. You always wanna know what your domain is before you move forward with your problem. So example three says, solve the rational equations and state the excluded values, right? Excluded values are those numbers that I can't plug into my function because they would give me a domain violation. So let's just quickly, before we even get into the nitty gritty of this, take a look at our denominators. You see here I have 3x, I have 4, I have 6x. Here I have 2x, 4x, and 4. All right, so these denominators that are constant with a denominator 4, I don't have to worry about that. Those denominators will, will never zero out because they're always 4. But these denominators, 2x, excuse me, 3x, 6x, 2x, and 4x, those can equal 0. And fortunately, they all equal 0 at the same spot. So how you determine your excluded values are set your denominators, the ones in question, the ones with the variables in them, set them equal to zero. So if I set my variables equal to zero, and I'll just do it here, if I had three x was equal to zero, I could divide by three on both sides, and I would have the threes cancel out and get x equaling zero. And you can see if you plugged in x equaling zero, three times zero is zero, that's a problem. And the same is gonna hold here, six times zero is zero, problem. 2 times 0, 0. 4 times 0, 0. So my excluded values for both of these examples, all right, x is 0. That's the problem. So my excluded value is 0. And just to give us some foreshadowing, all right, even though we're not there yet, if I was gonna ask you the domain for these functions, or excuse me, the domain for these equations, I would say that they were from negative infinity to zero, and then zero to infinity. And I'm just mentioning this because the, we're not gonna graph these or anything like that just yet. These are just equations. We're not asking you to graph these functions, but eventually we're gonna get here. When we turn these into functions, and I ask you for the domain, you're gonna say it could be all real numbers except for zero. And again, this is interval notation. If you've seen it before, great. If you haven't, don't fret. We are gonna get to it. And just again, this is foreshadowing. I want you to hear that term and see that expression so you become a little bit more familiar with it. All right, so let's get back to the task at hand. We've got the excluded values. Let's solve these rational equations. So if you don't like fractions and you have an equation, you can multiply every term in that equation by the least common denominator and knock out all of the fractions. And, and for those of you who don't like fractions, that's the way to go. Then get rid of them by multiplying by the LCD. So I'm just gonna kind of put another little arrow. I know I have tons of arrows. All right, but multiply equation by LCD to get rid of fractions. So let me show you what that looks like. So over here, I'm gonna say, well, my LCD, if I look at this, between my denominators, all right, I have the numbers three, four, six. The least common multiple of three, four, and six is 12. And then I have x to the first power here. I have no x's here, and x to the first power on the, this last denominator. So I have x to the first, x to the zero, x to the first. So I need to take that highest exponent, which will just be x to the first, and there's my LCD, 12x. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take my LCD, I'm gonna multiply it to this term, this term, and this term. So we're gonna do 12x times two over three x, that will be equal to 12x times one over four, minus 12x times one over six x. All right. So let me make sure that's within view. That might not be viewable. Let me scooch this up just so we can get all of this in view. All right, so I'm taking my least common denominator and I'm multiplying it to all three terms of my equation. Now when this happens, if it's done right, if you've got the correct LCD, the fraction should go away. I'm gonna sneeze, hold up. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, here we go. Let's see what cancels. I can see the X and the X cancel here, great. The 3 and the 12 simplify to a 4, and take note, my denominator's gone. 
Okay, great. Now, four times two will leave me with eight. Okay. Here, I see the four and the 12 cancel out and leave me with the three. Three times x times one is three. Oops, no, that's a lie, it's three x. All right, the x and the x cancel out, the six and the 12 cancel out, but leave a two. Two times one is two. So I have taken this ugly looking equation with all the fractions and look, I've simplified it to something that's not too terrible. Now we're back to equations like we saw in example one, linear equations, and I'm gonna just solve those. I'm gonna add two to both sides. I'm gonna get 10 is equal to three X, divide by three, and when I take a look at that, I've got X equaling 10 thirds. And just like with examples one and two, you can always plug 10 thirds into this equation and see if equality holds. And I just wanna show you how you could check this on your calculator, right? So if I wanted to do this on my calculator, I can do two divided by, and now in parentheses, three times 10 thirds, right? So that's the left side of the equation. Now let's try the right side. I have one fourth minus one divided by, in parentheses, oops, let me put that in parentheses, six times 10 thirds. And when I look at that, I get 0.2. Well, 0.2 is equal to 0.2, so I know I have the right answer. All right, so let's take a look at this equation. Now again, I wanna build the LCD. I wanna get rid of those fractions. So the LCD, I've got two, four, and four as the numbers, so four is the least common multiple. Again, x to the first, x to the first, this would be x to the zero. I need the highest power of my variable, so that would be four x. Okay, so let's multiply this in. I'm gonna just draw this line so that we can see the clear distinction between a and b. So I have four x times negative five over two x plus four x times three over four x equaling four x times negative seven fourths. All right, so here we go. I'll, I'll work it backwards. The fours cancel, that's great. Negative seven X. All right, the four X's cancel here, that's even better, three. Um, the X's cancel, the two goes into the four, two times, two times negative five is negative 10. So I'm looking at negative 10 plus three, which is negative seven, equaling negative seven X. I'm gonna divide both sides by negative seven. And my answer is X is equal to one. And again, I can plug that back in, see that it checks out and be happy with it, okay? So on the next page, we're gonna try a couple more of these rational equations. They're just gonna be a little bit more complicated. Same idea though, I'm gonna figure out what my excluded values are, and then I'm gonna get the LCD, multiply that through every term, knock out the fractions, right? Because as soon as you multiply that LCD, nicer looking equation, right? Much nicer looking equation. All right, I'll see you in a few, bye. Okay gang, let's look at a little bit more complicated type of rational equation. Again, I do have a rational equation. I've got my equal sign and I've got my denominators that have variables in them. The first thing I wanna do though is figure out what are my excluded values. So before I worry about anything, in terms of LCDs, let's set both of our denominators equal to zero. I'll start with two X plus one, right? I would subtract one from both sides I would get 2x equaling negative one. So I see I have an excluded value of negative one half. I'll just keep that in mind for right now. And then let's try it for three x plus one. When I let three x plus one equal zero, again, I subtract one from both sides. I get three x equaling negative one, which would give me x equaling negative one third. So I have two excluded values in this problem. x equaling negative one half and negative one third. And we'll practice once we start graphing those rational equations or rational functions, how to write this up in terms of a domain. But for now, this is good enough. I just know that when I work through these problems, if I get an algebraic answer of negative one half or negative one third, I have to give it the boot. All right, now again, if you don't like fractions, you have a way around that if you have an equation. You can multiply by the LCD. In this case, my LCD is both of, by, both of my binomials multiplied together. And when you hear me say binomial, I mean, if you look at this denominator, you have two terms, right? One, two, so it's bi. And it's nomials because that's what the nome stands for, terms. I have two terms in here. They happen to be added together. 
binomial, binomial. So each of these, with any fraction, you think of it as denominators or numerators and denominators have their own little set of parentheses around them, right, protecting them. We don't always write them because we don't need to, but they do have them. And this basically is 2x plus 1 to the first power, and this is 3x plus 1 to the first power. And I need each of those binomials represented in my LCD. And in this LCD, I will only raise each of those binomials to the first degree because they were raised to the first degree here, and that was the highest power I saw in those denominators. All right, so now let's take our LCD, multiply it to each of our terms, and see what cancels out. We should not have fractions left after we multiply by that LCD. So I'm going to take my LCD of 2x plus 1 and 3x plus 1. Oops. Excuse me. Multiply that to my first term. And then I'm going to take my LCD of 2x plus 1, 3x plus 1. Multiply that to my second term. All right, so I see the 2x plus 1s are going to cancel out and the 3x plus 1s are going to cancel out. And that's great. I'm not going to have any fractions left. So let's see how we're doing with this. So here I have negative 3 times 3x plus 1 and that should be equal to 4 times 2x plus 1. Okay, so let me go ahead and distribute that. We've got negative 9x minus 3, that will equal 8x plus 4. All right, and again, I think most of you would subtract the 8x over, which is totally legit. Go ahead and do that if you want. But I'm actually going to add the 9x. I like to have my variables with positive lead coefficients. It's just a preference of mine. So I'm going to move the 9x this way, and I'm going to start doubling up on my commands, and I'm going to move the 4 to the other side. I'm going to subtract 4 from each side. So as I start to finish this problem out, I see the 9x is cancel. Negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7. 8x and 9x is 17x. And then the 4s cancel. So let me just move this over here to see what we've got. At this point, I have 17x is equal to negative 7. I'm going to divide both sides by 17, and I'm going to see that x is equal to negative 7 over 17. Great. All right. Now, if I wanted to check myself, what could I do? I could take negative 7 over 17, and I could plug it back into both sides of that equation on my calculator to see if equality held. And I just want to show you a quick little um, a version of that on your calculator. So let me clear this out, right? I'm going to do negative 3 divided by, and my answer here, and I'm going to make sure I use parentheses, but my answer was negative 7 over 17, right? And I'm going to add 1 to that. When I get that done, oh, it looks like it was just the number 17. I hope I wrote that incorrectly. We'll see. So then we'll do 4 divided by 3 times it was negative 7 over 17 plus 1. And we, oh yeah, we got negative 17 both sides, both times. I was just a little suspicious. Usually when I plug numbers in, I don't get uh, uh, an integer back out. So I was like, well, maybe I did something wrong, but I didn't. And I checked it on my calculator and I was good to go. All right, I'm going to scooch the page up and then we're going to try part D. Now part D is the most complicated one that I gave you in this example, so it'll take us the longest to do, which is fine. Now again, before I get going, let's see what my excluded values are. And in order to do that, I've really got to factor this number, or this, excuse me, this trinomial here. So I don't need to factor my first term, that's fine. Don't need to factor my next term, but I do need to factor this term. Now, what multiplies to x squared? I've got x and x. What multiplies to negative 2, or yeah, multiplies to negative 2 but adds to negative 1? Well, I've got my options of 2 and 1. If I want a negative x between outer and inner, I'm going to put the negative here and the positive here. Now, we will practice factoring a little bit in this class, but not much. I get to assume you know how to factor heading into Math 31. And in my experience, we've seen factoring before, but we don't necessarily remember all the intricacies of it. So I have a couple of review worksheets up on Canvas for you. There's a couple of Khan Academy videos I have showing you how to factor. 
but you, you, if you struggle with it, you do want to take time and review that. I won't be going over factoring too much here. You should have seen it in algebra one or algebra two, or if you took it in college, elementary algebra or intermediate algebra. So we're walking into Math 31 assuming you know it. So that's, that's something that you might want to review a little bit on your own or take a look at those other resources up on Canvas if you're struggling with going from this trinomial, right, three terms, to this product of binomials. All right, so as I look at this, I want to talk about my excluded values. I ultimately only have the two denominators. So when is x minus 2 equal to 0? Well, if I add 2 to both sides, I'm going to see that's when x is equal to 2. And I kind of run it, ran out of room. It's kind of jammed in here. On the other denominator, right, if I had x plus 1 equaling 0, I would subtract 1 from both sides and get x equaling negative 1. So for this problem, my excluded values are x equaling negative 1 and 2. All right, now in terms of the LCD, if we look at these fractions, these denominators, I have x minus 2 here, x plus 1 here, and again, both of them on this front. So I have x minus 2 to the first power here. I have none of them here. I have one of them here. So I had a x minus 2 raised to the first power on both of those. So that is the power I will put on x minus 2 in my LCD. Same thing for x plus 1. There were none here, one here, one here. So I need 1 in my LCD. So now I'm going to take my LCD and multiply it to all three terms of my initial equation, and I should be able to knock out the fractions. So we're going to have x minus 2 times x plus 1 times 2 over x minus 2 plus x minus 2 times x plus 1, whoops, times 1 over x plus 1, and that should be equal to x minus 2 times x plus 1 times 1 over x minus 2 times x plus 1. Okay, let's see if we can get stuff to cancel like it should. So we can see that the x minus 2's go, I see the x plus 1's go, and then these entire fractions divide out. So we have here 2 times x plus 1 plus 1 times x minus 2, and that should be equal to 1. Okay. So now I'm going to start distributing, right? I can simplify this left side of the equation. We've got 2x plus 2 plus x minus 2 equaling 1. All right, I can still simplify the left side of that equation. We've got 2x and x, so that's 3x. All right, um, the 2's actually cancel, so this is equal to 1. I'm going to divide by 3 on both sides. So my end answer is x should be equal to 1 third. Okay, and one-third is not on my list of excluded values, so I'm good to go on this front. Now, I'm going to flip over to my calculator. I want you to see something called the store function, and I want you to see how you could check this, right? How do we plug one-third back in here and, and make our calculator do, do most of the work for us? Let's start to try and be efficient on our calculator. All right, so I'm going to flip to my calculator, or at least to my computer screen, show you how that calculator works. And then we'll, we'll come back and we'll start working on example five. I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Hey, Math 31. I just want to take a moment and show you a really cool function on your calculator to help you, not just in example 3D, but throughout the semester. Um, it's something called the store function. So when we were solving this on our video, we got our answer of one third. And it might be nice, especially when you get fractions, to be able to check your answer but it's a little cumbersome to try and enter one third in each time out. So what I mean by that is it's a little bit difficult to do two divided by parentheses, one third, right, minus two. And then we have to go through and add the second fraction, one divided by, right, one third plus one, so on and so forth, right? And we could get that, and then and we could do it to the second, the, the right side of the equal sign. It's not that you can't do this, but even I'm gonna struggle a bit, right? Like, and I like all this stuff. Like I'd have to put a special set of parentheses around the one third, square it, minus one third, minus two, close the parentheses. Hope I have all my parentheses correct. I did, 
but it's it's just you can start to see like it's hard to keep track of all those parentheses so there's something that your calculator can do I'm going to clear my key press history something called the store function so what I'm going to do is I'm going to program my calculator to remember that every time I push the X button I want it to evaluate it for the value of one-third so what I'm going to do is I'm going to store one-third into the X value all right, and your calculator has a little bit of memory in it, so I can store whatever I want. So here's what I mean. I'm going to type one-third, okay, and I'm going to hit store. It's above your on key. It looks like STO, and then there's like a little sort of sidewaysy triangle there. When you click that button, you'll see an arrow pop up on your calculator screen. All right, now I'm going to store that into X. If you remember from our last calculator example, X is directly to the right of your alpha key. So once I do that, I'm going to hit enter and my calculator is just going to say, sure, I did it. It's going to show me one third as a, as a decimal. All right, so now watch what you can do. Instead of typing in one third each time, I can just use the X button. I still need to be careful with my parentheses. Anytime you have a fraction and there's a binomial, or in this case, even a trinomial in the denominator or numerator, there's parentheses around it protecting it. We don't write them each time, but, but it's implied that they're there. So what I can do here is, oops, let me clear that out, excuse me. I can do two divided by x minus two, okay, plus one divided by x plus one, and again, in parentheses, Right, and if I hit enter, I get negative 0.45. And I, I would say that's easier to do than typing in the one-third each time. Right, and I can even test it with the right side of the equation. I can say, hey, calculator, can you get me 1 in ratio to x squared minus x minus 2, close out that parentheses, and I get negative 0.45. So there, the left side of my equation equals the right side of my equation. I know I got the solution correct. So that store function, I use it pretty frequently, especially when my solutions are fractions, and I just find it so cumbersome to type those fractions into the calculator. Okay, so with that, we're going to head on to example four. I will see you later. Bye.